Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. This is a little bit old-timey language. When you're making moral decisions and talking about them with your friends, family, co-workers, you don't often say to yourself things like, the principle by which I am deciding the case is as follows. You know, that's more you know, Victorian type language. But you do use principles. You say, well, here's my way of seeing it. Here's what I think matters. Here's, here's my um, criterion for judging this sort of thing. Here's why I think this ought to be done that way. That means you're appealing to some sort of principle, some sort of starting point for your reasoning, for your practical reasoning of what to do in this particular case. Bentham is advocating this principle of utility. Like we said, what is the principle of utility? It judges uh, actions based on whether they have a tendency to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest amount of people, that is to maximize happiness, minimize pain. Um, it looks at pleasure as being the good, pain as being the bad, and it looks at it for, for everybody. That's the principle of utility, also called the greatest happiness principle, not so much by Bentham, but more by later utilitarians like Mill. Is that the only way people make decisions? No. Uh, Bentham talks about three other principles by which people might decide this, one of which he thinks is not actually a real principle. It boils down to other things. Um, the principle of asceticism, he says, is always opposed to the principle of utilitarianism or principle of utility. What is asceticism? Do you guys remember that, that term? If somebody's ascetic, yeah. Mean like self-discipline. <coughs> yeah, now that's, that's the popular way to look at it. Asceticism is, is self-discipline. How do people who don't like asceticism uh, think about it? They use that word self, and then they, they add another term to it. So disciplined starts with a D as well. <coughs> What's that? That's oh, okay. Self-denial. If you're ascetic, you deprive yourself of, of pleasures. Why? I mean, there could be all sorts of reasons. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, there could be all sorts of reasons. Like, I'm not worthy of pleasure. I don't deserve anything. Some people are ascetic in that way. Other people, I can't trust myself if I, if I allow myself to indulge in this pleasure. If I eat just one of the chocolates, I eat the whole box, so I can't have any chocolate. Or, you know, if I'm, if I'm in, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not supposed to have any drinks, right? Why? Because if I have one, then I can't stop myself a lot more. If I'm a gambler, I can't go to the slot machine because the slot machine is going to lead me to the poker table and to destitution and, and you know, maxing out my credit cards and that sort of thing, right? Um, some people just seem to be of the mindset that pleasure by itself is a bad thing. You know, prudish people. You guys know some people like this? They see somebody else having fun, they're like, they shouldn't be having fun. That's not a good thing. They should be working, or they should be, you know, praying, or they should be doing something else, right? There, there's, all, you know, there's, there's all sorts of... Um, ways of being ascetic. And, you know, Christian monks out in the desert, they were ascetic. What was, what was their purpose? Um, you know, was it just to be, just to deprive themselves of everything? It'd be kind of a dumb reason to go out in the desert, you know, given the chance to actually live in the city. They wanted to be closer to God, right? Um, and they thought that depriving themselves of pleasures was going to be a good way to do that. But they were actually looking forward to, to a greater pleasure down, down the way. Um, if you're an athlete, you have to be kind of ascetic, right? You can't do anything that you like. Why? What's the, what's the purpose there? You want to win, right? You want to succeed? 
And um, if you're, if, even if you're not an athlete in the sense of a competitive athlete, you're just training, like you want to be in the marathon, oh, you want to, you know, you want to have that good feeling that comes with that. But during that time, you have to stop uh, eating what you like and drinking what you like and staying up as late as you want. And you have to go out and run even though it's, you know, raining and cold and, and force yourself to endure some, something like that. So, you know, some people are ascetic because they want it to pay off in something else. Some people actually get into the mindset where pleasure is bad, pain is good. And if they hold that position, then they're adopting the principle of asceticism. Bentham thinks that that's basically, when it comes down to it, insane. You know, uh, he doesn't give an awful lot of argument about it. He says, look, if you if you actually have the mindset that pleasure is a genuinely bad thing, you've got to say why it's bad. And if your reason why it's bad is because it's shameful, well, then you're really still worried about some sort of pleasure. You're just like contrasting pleasures of reputation against pleasures of, of the body. Or if it's success that you, you want, you know, you're going to be very disciplined and not allow yourself any pleasures because you want to be rich when you're 40. Really what you want is to be rich, and you're going to take pleasure in that. Um, you're just you know, deferring those pleasures for right now. So you, really, you're not that ascetic. And if you are truly ascetic and you think that pain is a good thing and pleasure is a bad thing, there's not much more talking to be done by the utilitarian. You're just nuts, he would say. Um, what about this other principle, principle of sympathy and ant antipathy? Now, we don't use antipathy that, that often. What is sympathy if you're sympathetic to somebody? Yeah. Feel bad for them? Yeah. Um, you sympathize means you, you feel with them. Um, and the way that Bentham is using this is a little bit different than that. He says that it is based on feeling, and it's almost like not having a principle at all. Because if you're judging on the principle of, of sympathy and antipathy, you look at an action and you say, how do I feel about that action? Do I like it? Do I dislike it? If I dislike it, it's a bad action. If I like it, it's a good action. And you can do this with people, too. You know, um, I like uh, people with uh, hair that's, I guess I'd call that sort of blondish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, brownish blondish. It's kind of hard to tell. I don't know. Change. Change <laughs> the way. So I don't like the dark-haired people, just the, the light-haired people. So I don't like him. And I don't like him because he's got some hair. But I do like him. And I like her and her. And so the things that they do are good, and the things that they do are bad. That's kind of silly, isn't it? We can just as easily reverse it. I like the dark-haired people. So what you do is good, and what you do is good, and what you do is bad. <laughs> or I like everybody except for the ones who you know, have birthdays on odd-numbered days. I don't even know which ones of you I like or don't like. But I'm sure there, there's some of you that have birthdays on odd days. And once I find out, I'll judge you for that. That's, that's what Bentham is talking about with this um, principle of sympathy and antipathy. It can be a lot more sophisticated than that. It can rationalize itself in all sorts of ways. But ultimately, it boils down to personal feeling. It's very much like a motivism. Remember when we talked about a motivism? It's just a matter of preference. That's all there is. And that's the way a lot of people do make decisions. Um, sometimes that will actually be in line with the principle of utility because it will tell you, um, hey, this is a good decision. But it will tell you that for the wrong reasons. The fact that I like it or I don't like it is not really a good reason if I'm a utilitarian for deciding an action is right or wrong. I should be using the principle of utility and looking at how it positively or negatively affects people. The last thing that he talks about you notice you're going to see this a lot in his works. He brings up religion, right? Why, did, why do you think he talks so much about religion and then talks so little about it? Why does he always mention religion? Think about when he's writing. He's writing in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Most people are at least professing to be religious back then, right? Most people had some sort of practice. Religion was often seen as sort of uh, int intrinsically connected with morality. Um, so, you know, if you were writing a treatise about 
morals, you would have to address religion to a certain degree. So why doesn't he, why does he say something like the theological principle is not really a principle? Or when he talks about the religious <coughs> sanction, it's not really a sanction on its own. Bentham thinks that religion just boils down to other things. So when we're talking about um, pleasures and pains, you know, there's what he calls the pleasures and pains of piety. Those are, you know, thinking whether God likes or doesn't like your actions. So if you think that God, you know, exists and God takes an interest in your actions and God thinks some things are good and God thinks other things are bad, then you're going to, you know, feel worried if you do a bad action and that'll produce a certain pain on your part. And if you do good actions, you'll feel happy because you figure God, you know, is happy with my, my behavior. Um, but really that comes down to the principle of utility. Unless God's a jerk or perverse, because God presumably would actually, according to Bentham, see that this is the right way to judge things. And so God would want you to do things like, what? Feed the hungry, fold the naked, visit those in prison, uh, comfort those who are afflicted. Why? Because God wants you to produce a greater balance of pleasures over pains for the community in general. So you don't really need a theological principle. You can just turn that into utility. If, if, if on the other hand, you think that God wants you to suffer, if that's your view of God, God's this mean guy up in the sky who we don't really, not really understand anything about, but he just wants us to have a, a terrible time down here, then you're really just using the principle of asceticism. And if you don't, if, you, if your view of God is God is just kind of whimsical, does whatever he wants, does whatever it wants, um, some things are good, some things are bad, but there's no rhyme or reason for it, principle of uh, sympathy and antipathy. You guys see how all these different principles work for, for Bentham. He's advocating this one. He's attacking these other two, and he's saying this one, it just boils down to one of these other three. 